Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. And as always, uh, thank you to Professor Wangwei Chang for organizing this event. I am Thorsten Servus from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And today it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Georgios Maragos. Dr. Maragos received his PhD in 2003 from Ghent University in Belgium, where he studied the, different, the effect of differential effusion in non premixed turbulent combustion. Currently, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Structural Engineering and Building Materials at Ghent University, working on fire modeling by using large eddy simulations with open form and fire dynamic simulator. And there he's looking at phenomena like buoyancy generated turbulence, flame spread, and pyrolysis. Today, he will talk about fire form and its application in fire research and fire safety. And I have used fire form myself in the past, so I'm very excited for his talk. And with this, uh, Dr. Maragos, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Thomas. Let me also share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, uh, you can see my pointer and the slides, right? Just to be sure. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Again, my name is uh, Georgios Maragos. I'm from uh, Ghent University. Uh, I mainly work on fire modeling with, uh, with CFD, focusing on, on large eddy simulations. Now the topic uh, uh, of my talk today will be fire foam and its applications in fire research. Now it's uh, it can be a quite broad uh, topic. Let's say the applications of the application of fire foam or fire modeling in general. What I will be focusing on is basically just to try to give you a brief overview of the fire foam uh, code. Uh, at least for those who are not so familiar with fire foam and those who are not so familiar with fire modeling in general, I would say. And also I will illustrate some of the applications uh, of fire foam in some, uh, some scenarios. Now, a brief outline of the presentation, I will uh, discuss some characteristics that we uh, have in fires as opposed to other types of flows like jet flames and so on. We'll uh, briefly touch on the different uh, scales which are involved in fires. Uh, we'll also discuss some modeling challenges when it comes to fires. Uh, I will also give a brief overview of fire foam, like what are the governing equations, uh, what are the subscrete sub scale models typically used to model turbulence, combustion, and radiation. And I will also give some examples of fire foam validation that I have uh, involved in the past, involving uh, non-reacting plumes, fire plumes, some scenarios uh, involving flame extinction uh, due to dilution, and also some uh, scenarios of flame spread. And I will end with a, sm a small uh, summary. Now, when it comes to uh, fires, uh, we can discuss some of the characteristics that are involved. Uh, one of the obvious one is that it involves multiphysics. Uh, so we don't only have turbulence, combustion, radiation, and heat transfer to, to model. Uh, this is only in the gas phase. If we have uh, more complex scenarios involving sprays and uh, uh, pyrolysis and flame spread, then uh, the physical processes that need to be uh, modeled are even more. So it, it can be quite challenging uh, trying to model uh, any given uh, fire scenario. We also have quite a wide range of time and length scales involved in such scenarios. When we are looking at time scales, it can be, uh, they can be vastly different. Uh, if we compare, for instance, a reaction time scale to a time scale uh, which is uh, involved in simulating uh, compartment fires or wildland fires, for instance. And also the length scales can be vastly different going down to the small scale that we need to resolve for the reaction rate, let's say, for the reaction to occur. Uh, or uh, up to length scales, which are involved in uh, big scenarios of uh, wildland fires again, or high rise buildings and so on. A typical difference between fires and jet flames is obviously that in the case of fires, we have uh, buoyancy generated turbulence. So typically the velocities that we have uh, close to the source, to the fire source are small, uh, which then uh, increase further downstream due to, due to buoyancy. 
Typically, we also have low temperatures in fires. Uh, we can have poor mixing, which results in incomplete combustion, meaning that in many scenarios, uh, depending on the fuel, of course, we cannot have some substantial uh, amount of CO and soot being produced. Also, if we uh, have to look into scenarios involving liquid evaporation and solid pyrolysis, we have uh, an even bigger challenge due to the heat feedback that we need to correctly capture to the fuel surface. And this is important because the heat feedback to the surface will then determine the, the evaporation rate or the solid pyrolysis rate. Uh, we typically have large scale puffing, which is uh, involved in, in fires. You see a snapshot of a helium plume where you see this characteristic uh, puffing. We will see it later on in the video as well. Uh, and this uh, results into uh, big entrainment rates close to the fire source that need to also correctly capture it. Uh, we also have uh, a laminar to turbulent transition occurring within a few diameters from the source. So, as I said, typically. Uh, the, uh, the flow conditions are uh, laminar or quasi-laminar uh, or weakly turbulent uh, near the source. And then further downstream, uh, it evolves into a more turbulent uh, flow. Some of the typical scales that are involved in fires, well, we said there is already quite a wide range uh, of them being involved. We see uh, the time scale uh, on, on the, on the uh, vertical axis and the length scale on, on the horizontal axis. If we are talking about mixing, uh, which is uh, important with respect to combustion in fires, then we can distinguish between uh, length scales, which are big in size, but that would mean coarse grid sizes. Uh, and then in these scenarios, it would be buoyant transport that is important. So you would need some sort of buoyant uh, mixing time scale, let's say. Going to smaller grid sizes, this is where the region of typical LES simulations that are used for fire modeling uh, is. This is where convective transport will be important. And then if we go into smaller grid sizes, uh, this would correspond to simulations which are well resolved or uh, some sort of laminar, quasi-laminar simulations. This is where the diffusive uh, transport is important. And then our mixing time scale should be able to, uh, to reflect that. When it comes to uh, modeling challenges that we have in fires, there are many. Uh, starting with turbulence, the main drawback is that most models that we used have been developed for high turbulent name, uh, Reynolds numbers. So they have been developed for jet flames, uh, momentum driven flows, while on the other hand, fires involve much lower Reynolds numbers and because they are buoyancy driven flows. That has the drawback that perhaps some of the um, typical mo uh, model constants that are used in turbulence modeling are not so applicable when it comes to fire scenarios. When it comes to combustion, uh, the typical way to model it is by using infinitely fast chemistry. In, uh, basically, we decouple chemistry from the mixing and we say that the mixing will be the limiting factor for reactions to occur. So uh, we try to model combustion just by uh, considering a mixing time scale. And because we typically use just a one step uh, reaction, then we have the limitation that we cannot easily predict minor species like CO uh, and so on. And of course, it also poses additional modeling challenges when it comes to flame extinction, uh, because we need an additional model to capture that. This additional modeling for flame extinction, we would not have as a, in the case where we would have uh, if we would consider finite rate chemistry for modeling combustion, for instance. Another uh, modeling challenge is when it comes to radiation is uh, we typically use the prescribed radio diffraction approach in order to guarantee that we have the correct amount of heat that is being released. Of course, that has the advantage that is not truly predictive. Uh, and of course, it's also uh, not so straightforward to apply this approach uh, when it comes to some scenarios, like, uh, for instance, involving flame extinction, because then the radio diffraction uh, changes uh, as, the, as, the, as the fire is, um, is, is going towards extinction. Of course, we also need to couple it with a soot model if we have uh, a sooty, uh, sooty fuel, which makes it even more uh, challenging as well. 
Of course, uh, SOOT modeling is also important and it can be uh, quite challenging. Uh, SOOT modeling is, uh, is an active uh, field of research uh, and so on uh, at this point. Another important aspect that we need to consider is convective heat transfer, which can be important in scenarios involving uh, liquid pool fires, for instance, or uh, solid fuels when it comes to flame, uh, flame spread and so on. And uh, capturing, uh, accurately capturing convective heat transfer uh, can be important when it comes to getting this uh, heat feedback to the fuel surface that we, that we set. It's also important to be able to capture this uh, blowing effect that we can have in, in such scenarios, uh, meaning the reduction in the convective heat transfer in the presence of mass transfer. Of course, pyrolysis can be quite challenging when it comes to modeling uh, solid fuels and the heating up of them. Uh, many times we have to use simplified pyrolysis model, just single reaction. Uh, which of course is not truly applicable when it comes to complex uh, fuels. And we also need to well characterize uh, the properties, uh, the thermophysical and chemical properties of the fuels being uh, involved. A last uh, important aspect that we also need to consider when it comes to evaporation, for instance, is uh, again, we need uh, not only to have the correct heat feedback at the, at the liquid fuel surface, but we also need uh, to correctly model evaporation itself, right, which can be important in liquid pool fires or uh, in the case where we have uh, water mist uh, systems. Now, of course, uh, a great modeling challenge that we have in fire is, is that we, we need to have um, or we want to have accurate CFD predictions over a wide range of, of grid sizes. This is the case of many uh, simulations being performed by fire engineers, right? Because they, they don't have the time, for instance, to, uh, to devote to run a, a really well resolved simulation. So we need to be accurate enough over a wide range of grid sizes. So we, we need our models to be able to perform fairly accurately in, in, in a wide range of scenarios. Now we need to be careful because there are actually a lot of parameters, of course, which are involved when running simulations, starting from boundary conditions that we can have at the burner surface, for instance. There are a wide range of model parameters being involved as well when it comes to turbulence, for instance. It can be the turbulence model parameter. When it comes to combustion, it can be the way we model mixing between fuel and oxidizer. When it comes to modeling flame extinction, uh, we can have uh, the critical flame temperature uh, being involved. When it comes to radiation, again, we can have several parameters being involved, like the additive fraction uh, or the path length if we try to model uh, absorption in the gas phase. We also have uh, various correlations being involved in, in convective heat transfer. We have the way we model suits and pyrolysis as well. And on top of that, we also have the important, many times, influence of numerical schemes, uh, particularly if we use coarse grids, right? So with having all this in mind, uh, we need to remember that if we start adjusting CFD model parameters, then we could uh, pretty much match any set of experimental data, right? But of course, we need to make sure that our models are accurate enough and they are able to self-adjust depending on, on the conditions. So the use of some sort of dynamic modeling would, uh, would be important or useful in this, in this sense. Ideally, we also need to extensively validate our CFD model using benchmark cases and considering well-characterized experiments. An example of this is some of the scenarios or the scenarios actually involved in the MACFP uh, workshop. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of Firefoam, uh, Firefoam is a CFD code which is based on the OpenFoam platform. It was originally developed by FM Global in the US uh, starting many years ago. Uh, it's written in, in, in C++ and it uses in the finite volume uh, code. It's uh, highly scalable on, uh, on parallel computers and has the ability to use unstructured messages as well. Now, the capabilities of Firefoam, obviously, in a way, they are coupled with the capabilities of OpenFoam in terms of submodels that can be used. 
right? Uh, so what I present here is just an overview of some of the models that are uh, that can be used with Firefoam, but of course these are not limited to only these, right? So when it comes to numerical schemes, we can use second order uh, with um, implicit implicit time integration. When it comes to mesh, we can have um, structured or unstructured. For modeling turbulence, we can use the one equation model, uh, whether uh, it's the constant or the dynamic one. We have the ability to use also the, the Smagorinsky model and also the um, wall adapting limiting eddy uh, uh, model. For modeling combustion, uh, we typically use the EDM, so the eddy dissipation model. Um, we have the ability to also to model flame extinction. There is a temperature strain rate model or the reactive volume fraction model by, uh, by Sergey, developed by FM Global again. When it comes to radiation, we can use the constant additive fraction or the gray gas model or the weighted sum of the gray gas model. For suits, there is a flameless based type of model. Uh, for modeling spray, uh, the Lagrangian particle method is used, and pyrolysis is modeled using a one step. Arrhenius type of, of model. Now, today's presentation, as I said in the beginning as well, will focus on the gas phase as well. Uh, but if you are interested in liquid and solid phase modeling with Firefoam, there is a lot of work in the past that was, uh, has been performed by FM Global. So I would suggest that you try to, to, to find this work uh, related to, to, to these types of, uh, of scenarios. When it comes to the governing equations, uh, so we typically solve for the mass equation, the momentum, right? We have uh, transport equation, equation for species, chemical species, and also we solve a transport equation, conservation equation for the sensible enthalpy. And the assumption that we typically use is that we neglect differential diffusion. So all the species have the same diffusivity and we also consider a unity Lewis number. Uh, meaning that the diffusion term in both the species and the energy equation is the same. We also consider equal turbulent numbers. So the turbulent spin number is typically taken the same as the turbulent Brownell number. When it comes to modeling turbulence, so for modeling the subspeed scale viscosity, we have the usual model, uh, the Smagorinsky one, with the coefficient CS that can be constant or calculated dynamically. We have the one equation turbulence model as well, where we can solve a transport equation for the subspeed scale kinetic energy. And this is basically also the model that is used in, uh, in FTS, in the fire dynamic simulator and other CFT code, which is uh, widely used for fire modeling. Or we can also have uh, the wall adapting eddy viscosity model, which can be quite accurate uh, in the near field of uh, of, wall, of walls, if you are interested in, in such uh, scenarios. When it comes to modeling subscript scale kinetic energy, uh, we can calculate it based on a transport equation, or we can use the local equilibrium model that we used together with the Smagorinsky model, of course, or we can use uh, some sort of scale similarity model, which is also the approach that is used in, in FTS. When it comes to turbulence modeling, more specifically, we're using the dynamics Magonisky. Uh, it has quite a few advantages uh, that it can be, one of them is that it can uh, predict zero subsequent scale viscosity in laminar regions or weakly turbulent regions. Uh, so it can capture this laminar to turbulent transition typically occurring in fires. So within this model, when it comes to calculating the subsequent scale viscosity, kinetic energy and dissipation rate, we can then uh, calculate uh, uh, the parameters involved uh, in these uh, expressions dynamically. One interesting thing to look at, uh, at the literature is you see a table with the different uh, CS values, so the different Smagorinsky values that have been reported based on theoretical studies. So you have the typical value of 0.17 uh, that has been uh, obtained by Lily. Of course, we can see that there is quite a wide uh, range in the reported uh, values. Uh, the same goes for the coefficient CE, which is involved uh, for the calculation of the dissipation rate. Uh, so again, these values have been reported for high turbulent flows, right? Which uh, are not strictly applicable to fires as well. Uh, 
And actually, accurate prediction of these subscript scale quantities, especially the kinetic energy and the dissipation rate, is quite important because they are typically involved in calculating uh, the mixing time scale in, in uh, fire scenarios. When it comes to combustion modeling, we typically tend to use the eddy dissipation uh, model, uh, which basically involves fast chemistry and one reaction with reversible chemistry react, uh, chemical reaction. And basically we try to decouple the chemistry from the mixing. And we say that the mixing will be the limiting factor of reactions. And we try to, uh, we, we basically calculate the fuel reaction rate uh, considering a stoichiometric mixture between a fuel and, and the oxidizer. And then the main thing that we need to uh, calculate or uh, approximate is this mixing time scale, which is involved in the reaction rate. Of course, in fires, uh, we can have a wide range of time scales being involved. It can be uh, diffusion that is dominant in regions where the flow is, uh, is uh, very laminar like, right? Or we can have uh, advective transport in, in regions where we have um, high velocities, for instance. We also often have weakly turbulent conditions that we said above the, of the fire source. So this, um, these characteristics do pose some, uh, some challenges when we uh, want to calculate this mixing for time scale. What is used by default in, in fire form is uh, that we calculate this mixing time scale by considering laminar and turbulent conditions. So we consider a laminar time scale, which is diffusion dominated. Uh, and we also consider a turbulent time scale, which is advection dominated and can be calculated uh, based on the substitute scale quantities like kinetic energy and the dissipation rate. There are, of course, some other uh, alternative mixing time, uh, time scales that have been used together with EDM in the past. We have some sort of also an effective diffusion time scale that have, has been used in the past with uh, FDS or the CFB code ICES. We also have the time scale which is currently used in FDS, which considers uh, difficult, uh, different pro processes. So it considers considers a time scale for diffusion, advection, and buoyancy, and takes the minimum of them. We also have a mixing time scale based on the resolved strain rate has had been used or is being used by fluent. And we also have some other uh, time scales uh, in literature as well. For instance, we have a time scale, a turbulent time scale, which calculates mixing based on the geometric mean of uh, this integral, let's say time scale on a SGS level and the Kolmogorov time scale, uh, and so on. There hasn't been quite uh, a validation, let's say, or a comparison between these different time scales. I would say in literature, uh, this is something that we are we are working at least. Uh, uh, we are current, currently working ourselves. When it comes to flame extinction and reignition, that can be important in the case of fast chemistry. Uh, what is typically done is you consider a constant temperature for flame ignition and reignition, and then the flame extinction uh, can be based on, on the concept, concept of a critical flame temperature, which again can be constant or varying locally uh, and so on. When it comes to radiation modeling, we typically use the finite volume discrete ordinates methods, and then we can distinguish between an optically thin and opt uh, optically thick approach. Uh, that implies that in the optically thin, we neglect any absorption, while in the latter case, we do consider it. So on the optically thin approach, that would be the constant relative fraction. Then we basically just say that the, the heat fluxes can be calculated as uh, the constant relative fraction of the fuel times the local heat release rate per unit volume. Basically, we neglect uh, modeling any absorption and we model the net effect uh, by this. By doing so, we can guarantee that we have the correct heat that is released due to radiation and we avoid um, any TRI modeling that could be used. Uh, but of course, we do introduce 
some uncertainties in our modeling because we neglect any, any absorption uh, in the gas phase. In the optically thick approach, um, a typically used model is the weighted sum of gray gases, which lies in between the gray gas model and the complete model we, where we consider uh, spectral, uh, the spectral absorption bands uh, for, its, for its fuel. And in this case, we basically can calculate the uh, relative fluxes by calculating the emission and the absorption that we can have. Now, within the WSDG model, uh, what we need to calculate uh, is what we need to estimate actually is the path length. And now what I present is a gray version of the weighted sum of gray gases. And then this path length essentially uh, can be estimated uh, based on, on the domain that you have. It can be cell-based. It can be calculated locally based on the local heat release rate. Uh, but it's a quantity that can be important in, in uh, accurately capture the absorption coefficients. When it comes to this uh, WSDG model compared to other approaches, uh, we discussed how the additive fraction approach might not be very accurate or applicable to flame extinction scenarios because the rather diffraction in such scenarios will not be constant, actually would vary uh, with the intensity of the fire. Uh, another advantage of the WSG model compared to the gray gas, the, the usual gray gas model is that uh, the latter tends to over predict the rather diffractions and you often need uh, calibration constants. Another important thing is, uh, of course, the LES grid that we use for fire simulations, right? Then we can approximate what would be uh, a good grid size to start with, right? So we can use an a priori criterion. This is based on the D star. Uh, so you calculate what would be uh, your uh, fire, your effective fire diameter, and then you compare it with a grid size. And you basically want to uh, this ratio to be above uh, 15, uh, at least in the order of that. Um, another a priori criterion for estimating the appropriate grid size is just a simple rule of thumb, which says that you need to start with having at least 10 cells across the burner diameter. Looking at a posteriori criteria in evaluating the grid size, one of them is obviously and should always be performed as a grid sensitivity study with using three different uh, grid sizes. The other one is the usual hope criterion where you need to, it is suggested at least, to resolve at least 80% of the, of the kinetic energy. Another thing that we can look at also is the ratio of grid size to the Kolmogorov length scale. And we need, uh, we would like this ratio to be small enough, like in the order of 10. Or we can also look at the ratio of subscrit scale to molecular viscosity. And again, um, we would like this ratio to be as low as possible. Uh, with uh, and if this ratio would be zero, for instance, it would correspond to fully resolved uh, simulations. I will also just uh, show some examples of uh, fire foam validation, looking at some non-reacting plumes, some fire plumes, some flame extinction scenarios, and flame spread. Starting with a non-reacting, this is the Sandia helium plume. Uh, if you're for those who are familiar with it, it's also involved in the MACFP workshop. We basically have helium as fuel issued by a one meter uh, diameter here. There is a, a surrounding wall. Um, and here you can see just a, a video of the simulations of it, of the simulation of it. On the left-hand side, you see the helium mass fraction. On the right-hand side, you see the velocity. Uh, what we typically see is you see once the simulation starts uh, reaching some sort of steady state, we see this characteristic puffing, of course, that we have discussed up to now. We also see the instabilities being generated close to the edge, and then they are uh, going towards the center line due to the lower density. We have the rail plated or instability being triggered, and then we have the, uh, the helium being convected uh, downstream. We, we can look at uh, the predictions at two different heights. 
uh, above the burner. What you see here is the actual velocity that we that we have predicted as a function of three different grid sizes. Um, we can also look at the radial velocities, so related to the entrainment that we have at different heights, and also the helium mass fractions. And we see that they are all fairly well predicted uh, for this scenario. Another important thing uh, in order to see whether we can capture the puffing correctly is to look at the puffing frequency. Uh, and then we examine this as a function of grid size. We see that for petty coarse grids, we don't really get a clear puffing frequency, right? But as we refine the grid size, then we do start to have a distinct peak. Um, and on finer grid sizes, we also have a puffing frequency, which uh, is close enough to the, to the experiments. Uh, moving into fire plume scenarios, now we have the, the usual case of McCaffrey's uh, experiments involving natural gas with different heat release rates. And these experiments are, even though are old and they're not really, uh, there are some uncertainties related to the temperature measurements, they are still very important, I would say, because you can have, uh, or can, you can observe whether you can uh, get correct scaling of temperature and axial velocity with uh, increasing uh, heat release rate. So we did this exercise as well. So we tried to see how the excess temperature and uh, actual velocity scales for different heat release rates uh, and for different grid sizes. Now at the very coarse grids, we don't really get correct scaling nor correct temperature prediction, but going at the uh, uh, grid size of three centimeters, which again starts to be at least 10 cells across the burner diameter, we see that we have correct, uh, the scaling is quite good and the, the data cluster well uh, together. Another example is the Waterloo uh, pool fire. So this is a 30 centimeter uh, methanol pool fire with a heat release rate of about 22 uh, kilowatts. And again, as a part of validation exercise, we try to see how the center line temperature, uh, either the mean and the RMS vary with different grid sizes. And also we examined the actual velocities uh, as well. And then some radial profiles, again, of temperature, of axial velocity. And again, at the, at the point further upstream, uh, again. Another uh, validation test case that has been considered is the UMD line burner. So as the name says, it is a line burner of 50 centimeters in length and five centimeters in width. It involves, we consider methane in this case, uh, uh, and the heat release rate is 50 kilowatts. Again, we try to see at the, at the center line temperature, uh, the mean and the RMS as a function of grid size. And we also try to look at the radial profiles of temperature at two different heights to see uh, whether we can accurately capture the scenario. You see that in most cases, we, we are close enough to the experiments. The, the agreement is not always perfect, but at least we are on the correct order of magnitude uh, when it comes to temperature and, and velocity prediction. Now, what I show here is uh, the Smagorinsky constant, the CS. So this is the parameter again, which is involved in the subscript scale viscosity, if you remember. And we show the predicted values of this parameter on the center line. Basically, we look at the actual distance uh, normalized by the flame height in its scenario. And we show, we show the predictions for different uh, for the different scenarios that were involved. And I show this just to, to illustrate again what I discussed earlier that the, the conditions uh, close to the burner in, in most fire scenarios are not highly turbulent. And this is reflected in the Smagorinsky constant CS as well, where we see that it starts from fairly low values in most cases, and then it starts increasing uh, further downstream. So this is something that uh, we should have in mind and should ideally be able to be captured by our uh, turbulence model as well. This is just an illustration of some flame extinction scenarios that we have performed. On the left-hand side, you see a scenario for the UMD line burner, again, with methane and 50 kilowatt that I, uh, we saw earlier. On the right-hand side, we have the FM burner uh, with ethylene and 10 kilowatts. 
And these scenarios basically involve uh, reducing the, uh, the oxygen content in the, in the cold flow uh, here. And also the same with the FM burner as well. So you start actually seeing slowly that the oxygen con content in both scenarios is reduced. And essentially the, uh, the temperature also decreases until the flame goes to extinction as well. Now, trying to model flame extinction with fast chemistry, as is typically done in, in fire modeling, can be quite challenging because we need to have accurate temperature predictions, right? Because flame extinction is often modeled using critical flame temperature. So we try to compare the cell temperature to a critical flame temperature, right? So accurate tem uh, temperature prediction is quite important, which is back then linked to accurate modeling of turbulence, combustion, radiation, and so on. So it's all uh, it's all a, a positive, uh, positive loop that you have to accurately capture, basically. This is also a more quantitative comparison of our predictions when it comes to flame extinction. What you see is the combustion efficiency uh, as a function of the oxygen mold fraction in the cold flow for different fuels and different configuration. In this case, this is for the FM burner. This is with the UMD line burner. Basically, you start with a combustion efficiency of one at ambient conditions, right? And then you start uh, reducing the oxygen constant content in the cold flow until you go towards extinction. What you see with gray here is the, the range of limited uh, oxygen concentration values that have, have been reported in the literature. And with the symbols here, you see the experimental data of the combustion efficiency. So uh, you also see the numerical predictions with fire foam with black as a function of different grid sizes. Uh, just so we see how, how much does the grid size influence our, our predictions, right? We see that in, in most cases, we are fairly accurate, let's say, for different fuels as well. So going to, to propane and to propene as well, and to ethylene, we are able to do a reasonable uh, job when it comes to prediction, uh, predicting flame extinction as well. And for, like I said, in these scenarios, we do want to be as grid insensitive as possible, right? Because uh, extinction will be closely uh, linked to the temperature prediction as well. This is just to illustrate some other examples related to flame spread that we have looked at. On the left hand side, you see the modeling of some single burning item experiments, so the typical SBI, where you have two perpendicular panels, one long one and one short one, and you put a triangular burner in between. This is a, uh, a propane burner, and we see how flame spreads uh, over the panels. This is a simulation of the parallel panel configuration of the FM Global, and this is a simulation of the rack storage scenario again. Uh, an experiment performed by FN Global, where you have different cardboard boxes and you put a, fire, a small fire at the bottom and you see how the fire spreads over, uh, over the boxes. Again, for a more extensive validation of fire foam in scenarios involving flame spread, I would, uh, I would guide you to work, to extensive work done by FN Global. Uh, you can, um, find a lot of papers uh, in the literature, which are very, uh, very useful. I just wanted to illustrate, or at least to show some more quantitative comparison of our fire foam predictions in the SBA ex experiments for different fuels, so for MDF and plywood. Uh, with the symbols, you see the experiments, of course, with the lines, you see the fire foam predictions using different approaches for modeling convection. Uh, what I wanted to, to stress is that even though convective heat transfer is, uh, is not considered as important when it comes to flame spread, obviously radiation is the dominant mode of heat transfer in those scenarios, typically involving 80% of the total heat. But still, what we observe is that even convection only accounts for about 20%. The accurate modeling of convection can be important in, in such scenarios, because if you if you underpredict convective heat transfer in the beginning, you have a lower, slower heating up of the virgin material and results in, uh, in different burning. Uh, 
So differences in the preheating of a material in the early stages can actually be quite important in, in flame spread scenarios and uh, are worth uh, trying to, to model accurately. Uh, this is just to, to some other applications of fire foam that we have looked on. Uh, on the left hand side, you see an attempt to use adaptive mesh refinement. This is again the helium plume scenario that I showed earlier, uh, where we try to use uh, an adaptive mesh refinement in order to try to reduce the number of grid sizes and, of course, the, the, the total uh, computing time as well. Of course, uh, you can also have also applied. Uh, fire foaming compartment fires, which is a, an important scenario to consider. Uh, we have also looked at spray plume interactions. This is a scenario, this is a simulation actually, again, of, a, of an FM global experiment, which involved a spray with, a, with a thermal plumes at different convective rates. Uh, and we have also looked at benchmark cases, like trying to model uh, decaying isotropic, isotropic turbulence scenarios and try to see whether we can validate our turbulence model. So in summary, um, I try to give you some of the main characteristics uh, often involved in fires and some of the typical scales involved in them. I try to outline some of the uh, challenges involved in fire modeling, at least based on my experience and focusing on the gas phase uh, mostly. Uh, I also gave you a brief overview of the fire foam code, like the equations and the submodels that are often used, or at least I use in, in my simulations. Uh, and I also showed you several uh, examples of fire foam validation. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, Professor Bart Messi from, from Ghent University, uh, with whom I have done this work uh, all these years. Uh, some funding from FWO in Belgium, and of course, uh, past and current colleagues from, from Ghent University for all the discussions um, that we have had all these years. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be happy to, to hear them. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, for the audience, you can write your questions uh, in the chat. I can already see one question. Uh, maybe I start with a very quick and uh, more general question. Um, you said you are using both open foam and fire dynamic simulator. So mm -hmm. I don't know the fire dynamic simulator, but could you give us a reasoning why you use both tools? What are the uh, advantages, disadvantages of both? Yeah, of course. Actually, when it comes to fire modeling, FDS is the I would say the most popular CFD tool that is used. Uh, it has also been uh, older, let's say, compared to fire foam, uh, and also has a quite quite a lot of capabilities as well. Actually, uh, FDS is a uh, is specific specific for fire modeling as well, right? Uh, now, FDS and fire foam, I would say, at least based on personal experience, have their own advantages and disadvantages, right? Uh, so you have different capabilities in, in terms of meshing, I would say. Uh, when it comes to modeling itself, uh, I would say the models that are used by, by both codes are similar. Uh, they both use path chemistry, you know, now uh, they have different turbulence model to be used as well and, and radiation as well. Uh, I would say based on at least, again, personal experience, I would say that Fire foam might be uh, more suitable at least, or at least has paid more attention up to now to, to model flame spread, uh, while FDS uh, would be more suited or at least would have, it would be fairly, let's say, confident to model smoke transport uh, and so on. Uh, but again, this is personal experience, so, in my, in my research, I try to use both tools uh, uh, because, yeah, because of different projects, for instance, and so on. Uh, yeah, I think one one advantage of, of FDS surely is that it's more user friendly. Uh, it's uh, much easier to start using FDS and to model a fire scenario, while the learning curve of open form and fire form is quite steep. Um, so, typically, students. 
uh, studying fire safety engineer would would prefer using FDS from from that aspect yeah, because it's very easy to start with. Uh, but when it comes to to modeling capabilities, I would say that both of them are uh, are well mature and, uh, and accurate enough and have their own advantages and disadvantages in specific areas, you know. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I think it's a very good point that is often forgotten that even though open form can do a lot, learning open form can be really challenging. Um, we have some questions from the audience, so I think the two questions in the uh, uh, Q&A are the same, so I just read the second one out. Uh, the EDM model is developed based on the fast reaction hypothesis. Is there any method to make it applicable for the flame in high Reynolds number flow, which is greatly stretched, or are there any models which are better uh, suitable for these conditions? Well. If I understand the question correctly, I mean the the edit dissipation model is uh, has been developed with uh, or, and has been applied in high Reynolds number of flows, right? Uh, so it has been validated and actually uh, been applied in uh, in jet flames. So in that sense, I would not see a, a problem in using EDM for this type of flows. I mean it has been developed with jet flames in mind, uh, right? Okay, so is there, if there's any follow-up question, thus just write them into chat. Uh, there's another question by uh, Professor Hangwei Zhang. Do you want to ask the question yourself? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, Georges, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So, uh, I think on slide uh, 35, uh, we have a five uh, spray interaction case, right? So it seems yeah. that actually the spray cannot quantify the fire and uh, the, 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 the fire is always there. So uh, do you have any more like explanations for this case? So what are the key uh, factors of the sprays, like the constitution or like the spray, uh, what job rate diameter, you know, uh, what are actually important to quantify? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, I didn't discuss actually, uh, what you see is uh, just a short, a short simulation. Actually, I wasn't able to run the simulation long enough, right? But what you see is actually the interaction of a spray on top with a thermal plume uh, with a certain convective heat release rate. Uh, so it's not an actual fire, it's just a thermal plume. Oh, okay. And when modeling these scenarios, we basically try to look at uh, the interaction of the spray plume uh, and, and with the spray and the thermal plume. And we tried uh, to model different uh, convective heat release rates in order to see whether we can actually correctly capture the interaction plane, because the interaction plane would shift up or up or down depending on the convective uh, heat release rate of the thermal plume. Uh, so yeah, what you see is actually not, not a fire. So in that sense, the, the spray on top will not uh, fully, you know, will not uh, extinguish the fire, but also the simulation is not long enough in order to get a more, more, uh, a better insight of where this interaction plane between the two would be. Uh, but just to give you, uh, I wanted to include it just to give you an indication that we can, uh, you can also try to model such scenarios with, uh, with Firefoam. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from the audience. So in the beginning, you said that for these plumes, typically you have a rather laminar condition. And then as the plume develops, you transition, transition to turbulence. So yeah. the question is, in your experience, how suitable is the whale model for this kind of laminar to turbulent position uh, flows? That's a good question. I actually have never applied it myself uh, in fire plume modeling. Uh, I know that uh, many people uh, have used it. Also, uh, it has been used by, by work of FM Global because it's supposed to be good for the, uh, for the regions in the near wall, right? Based on what I've seen is that the, the whale model and the Smagorinsky will be similar in the in regions far away from the walls, but uh, the whale model is supposed to be much better at capturing uh, the decreasing velocity uh, near the wall. But normally for fire plume scenarios, I think it should not matter so much whether you use that or the Smagorinsky. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, from your experience, how important is it to account for backscatter in fire plume modeling? 
again, I've tried it many times. Uh, I know there are many probably different approaches to try to capture this backscatter. Now, for those who have, of you who are not familiar, backscattering implies that you have a reverse energy cascade in a way, that you have the small scales being uh, transferring energy to the large scales, as opposed to the typical energy cascade that we are used to from, uh, uh, from the theory. Now, one way that I've tried to include this backscattering is by allowing the subscript scale viscosity, viscosity to, to take negative values. Uh, and then by limiting the effective viscosity to be zero. So by allowing for some negative subscript scale viscosity, you try to, in a way, to account for this backscattering as well. Now, again, uh, based on my experience in the scenarios that I have applied it, uh, I personally didn't see a big influence of that. But I don't know whether it's just the approach that is not suitable, or it's really that the backscattering is not as important. Uh, you know. Okay, interesting. Um, are there any more questions from the audience or from the panelists? Otherwise, I have one more question. So in my work with OpenFOAM, sometimes I find that if you include buoyancy, which of course, in your case, you have to include buoyancy, sometimes it's hard to get OpenFOAM to converge because of the boundary conditions. Do you have any experience with the troubles with OpenFOAM's boundary conditions and buoyancy? Do you have any solutions for that? Uh, when it comes to Firefox simulations, I wouldn't say that I have a problem uh, with uh, the boundary conditions, no. But uh, I have experienced it when I try to use some other software uh, solvers in OpenFOAM, like Buoyant, uh, Piso, mm -hmm. Pimple Foam. I've seen there that it actually matters how you model the boundary conditions. Otherwise, you might have some sort of uh, deceleration of the flow at the, at yeah, the yeah. boundary. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not really the case, at least personally with Fireform, but as you say, yeah, it can be quite important uh, modeling of the, of the boundary conditions, yes. Uh, okay, do we have any other questions? Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes, of course. Yeah, um, so from your uh, simulation, I think you uh, probably uh, one of them or some of them use the EMR, right? Uh, adaptive mesh refinement in uh, three-dimensional LES. So how about the, the, because you mentioned this can reduce the total mesh number, right? So did you compare the computational efficiency uh, with uh, like uh, static mesh, static yeah. high mesh, right? Yeah, this yeah. is my question, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. Actually, this has been the topic of a, of a paper we published with Bart. Uh, we basically, it related to the, the use of AMR in fire modeling, and we applied it in this uh, helium plume scenario that you see. To our surprise, we didn't really see any advantage in that scenario with using AMR, actually, because you can get away with using a static mess as well by carefully selecting actually a static mesh, a mesh which is small enough, uh, you can get away with using, with using a static mesh as opposed to using AMR. And then because you were able to have a comparable number of cells between a static and, and AMR, in our simulations, at least the static simulations were always faster because uh, there's always some sort of uh, um, you know, added, added load being involved in the AMR in order to um, estimate whether you need to uh, refine your mesh or not and so on. Uh, so surprisingly enough, we were not able to really get any significant advantage uh, from the use of AMR for that helium plume scenario. Again, because you can get away with choosing, with carefully choosing a static mesh, which is small enough in order to reduce the, the total number of cells that you end up in a, in a cost which is very similar to the use of AMR, actually. OK, OK, yeah, good to know. OK, thanks. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, I have one more final question from my side. So you've shown that, obviously, in these uh, fire uh, research, there are a lot of phenomena playing into this. So you have radiation, you have the chemistry modeling, turbulence modeling, and so on. 
And from your experience, let's say you had to spend some money on, on research. What is the one area where you have currently the least understanding or where you would profit the most from a better understanding from the modeling perspective? At least to me, there are, there are uh, quite a few challenges, as I, as I said. When it comes to simple fire flu modeling, I think we are in a, in a state where we can model them quite accurately. Uh, but I think when it comes to scenarios involving flame spread, uh, because they involve both the gas phase and the solid phase, I think there is still some work to be done. Uh, there is some work to be done because you, in, in such scenarios, you not only have more uh, challenges in the gas phase, because you also have the soot being involved. Uh, so not only you need to accurately capture soot or the effect of soot, at least in the heat transfer process, but you also have the, the solid phase as well, which can be uh, important, uh, which then relates to not only having temperature dependency of the properties of the material, you can need uh, multiple reactions in modeling the decomposition of the solid material, and then basically capture, accurately capturing this, this, heat fact, uh, this heat feedback uh, is, is a key factor for uh, determining the solid evaporation rate and flame spread. So if I, if I could, I would focus on, on flame spread uh, modeling with trying to enhance uh, both the gas phase and solid phase modeling. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? This might be your final chance to ask about Fireform. Okay, if there are no final questions, then I think I'll give the last word to Wangwei. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Georges, for your very nice talk. And I also would like to thank uh, Sosten to host uh, Georges' uh, uh, webinar. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank see you, you all. Bye-bye. See, see you next time. Bye.